In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, we read about the sons of Ishakar who had understanding of the times. And I want to ask us, do we have understanding of the times? Do we know what is happening in our Western world? We see the collapse of the Christian fabric, the collapse of the Christian worldview. Why is that? Because a foundation has been removed and the structure is collapsing. What foundation? The foundation of the authority of the Word of God. It's about time God's people went out there unashamedly, uncompromisingly, stood on the Word of God and said, this is what it's all about. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Show that we can defend our faith. If we start standing on the Word of God, that's what's going to change this nation. Hi everyone, um, it's my pleasure to again um, be with you here at the noon hour um, to bring you a presentation today on eugenics, abortion, and our future, the quest for perfection. And this is actually uh, part one, so you'll want to be sure to tune in tomorrow uh, for part two of this. And uh, my name is Georgia Purdom. I am a scientist, researcher, writer, speaker, uh, lots of different things here at Answers in Genesis. And even though we are temporarily closed because of the current uh, pandemic, we want to keep bringing uh, lots of great um, programs to you through the internet. We love that technology allows us to do that. So uh, we're going to be doing that here um, now for the noon hour. And I want to start by defining the term eugenics because it may be a term uh, that you're not readily uh, familiar with. And um, so eugenics was a term that was actually first coined in 1883 by Francis Galton. And Francis Galton is considered the father of eugenics. And interestingly, he was was also a cousin of Charles Darwin, who was obviously the father of evolution by means of natural selection. And later on, I'm going to discuss some of the robust connections that we see between eugenics and evolution. So eugenics literally means good in birth or well-born. Um, being born with certain desirable characteristics as defined by a particular group or society. Um, some people might define it as healthy or fit. A lot of societies would. Uh, no deformities or disease. Um, for the Nazis, it was light hair and blue eyes. And so those are, that's the idea, um, being born in a certain way that is fit and with desirable characteristics. Now, the practice of eugenics um, was first brought to national attention here in the U.S. in 1915 with the case of Baby Bollinger. And there was a, a newspaper a reporter that recorded these words upon seeing the baby. He said, a pink bit of humanity lay upon the white cloth. Its blue eyes were wide open. Its hair was brown and silky. It dug at its fist with little face with little fist. It cried lustily as it drew up chubby legs and kicked out. It seemed quite vigorously informed with life. However, as he also noted, the baby had certain deformities. Um, the doctor's reports confirmed that the baby was missing an ear, had curvature of the spine, some paralysis, and deformities of other um, body areas as well. However, it was not questioned by the doctors that a simple surgery could save that child's life. But this child was sentenced to death. Why? Because the doctor who was in charge, Dr. Harry uh, High Selden, did not want to perform the surgery and actually convinced the mother, Anna, to allow the child to die. Why? This is what the doctor said. He said, there's no doubt the child would be defective mentally and morally if allowed to live. It might be criminal. Certainly it would be dependent. It would be a burden to itself and to society. And many doctors and others agreed with him. He was actually tried in court for murder and he was found not guilty. And when asked by a reporter, is this a common practice among doctors? He replied, not infrequently. So instead of doctors saving lives, they were actively destroying them. And honestly, when we, when we read that and think about that in relation to our culture today, we know that sadly in the hundred you know, years or so since this occurred, not much has changed, right? In 2004, a doctor from the Netherlands published what was called the Groningen Protocol. And Basically, it was a series of statements that doctors and parents should consider to decide if euthanasia of a, a newborn is justified. And so here were some of the um, parts of this protocol that, again, deciding if the baby should be euthanized, which is just a fancy way of saying kill the baby after it's born. Newborns have no chance of survival, so that should result then in euthanasia. Newborns who require intensive care to survive with a poor prognosis and a very 
poor quality of life. Infants for whom there is no hope in the long term and who in the eyes of the parents and the medical team are suffering unbearably. And when I read these, you know, I can't help but thinking they seem rather arbitrary, right? Because, for example, who determines what a poor quality of life is and what does no hope mean? I mean, who determines what is unbearable suffering and how would you even know that um, for anything for certainty when you're dealing with an infant who can't talk to you and describe what he or she is feeling. So obviously from a, and obviously when we look at this from a Christian worldview, from a biblical worldview, we'd say, well, are any of those things even relevant? Because regardless of the infant's disease or deformities, we are talking about a human being that is made in the image of God. And therefore their life is valuable and should be preserved. And honestly, when you read these, you have to ask yourself, well, where does it stop? right? What about numbers four, five, and six? Because as you continue to proceed down this list that I'm showing here, it gets broader and broader who this infant euthanasia should apply to. And in another few years, I'm sure there'll be more things that we should consider and more um, infants who would, they would say euthanasia is preferred. We have to realize that eugenic ideas are alive and well in the present. So in this presentation um, today, what I want to do is start by discussing the history of eugenics and how evolution really provided a foundation or essentially the roots uh, for eugenics. And then what we're going to do is understand how that in turn provide a foundation or essentially the roots for abortion and Planned Parenthood. So this is necessary. We have to understand the history first and understand what's happening today and what's going to come in the future, which I'll talk more about in my presentation tomorrow. You know, I'm sure many of you have heard the saying, um, those who don't know history are bound to repeat it. But I would also add, those who don't know God's word um, and what it says on the issue of life are doomed not to obey it. So we need to know, um, we need to understand this from a biblical and a Christian worldview. So let's start with some history. And so the goal of eugenics is really to create a superior race of human beings. Uh, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, who's the founder of the Race Betterment Foundation, said, we have wonderful new races of horses, cows, and pigs. Why should we not have a new and improved race of men. And when you see the name Kellogg, you think, well, does that have anything to do with my breakfast cereal? Yes, it does. Okay. It's the same, the same person that started that company. Um, and many eugenicists at his time believed that the principles used in breeding animals should also be applied to man because after all, right, man was also or nothing more than an animal. Eugenicists believed in evolution. Leading eugenicist Paul Popino stated, there are only two ways to improve the germinal character of the race to better it in a more fundamental and enduring manner. One is to kill off the weaklings born in each generation. That is nature's way, the old method of natural selection, which we all agreed must be supplanted. When we abandon that, we have but one conceivable alternative, and that is to adopt some means by which fewer weaklings will be born in each generation. So what he's saying here is natural selection is working too slowly, okay? It's not working fast enough, and people are not allowing it to really work like it should because we're saving the people that are sick, we're helping them. So what do we do? He says the only hope for permanent race betterment under social control is to substitute a selective birth rate for nature's selective death rate. That means eugenics. So they, again, they did not think like things like charity in the form of taking care of the poor, um, taking care of the sick, because it was inhibiting natural selection, right? It was no longer survival of the fittest, it was survival of everyone, and that was, that was prohibiting us from evolving into better and better human beings. Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, said, organized charity itself is a symptom of a malignant social disease. Our civilization has bred, is breeding, and is perpetuating constantly increasing numbers of defectives, delinquents, and dependents. My criticism, therefore, is not directed at the failure of philanthropy, but rather at its success. So she didn't want people giving to the poor. She didn't want people helping the sick because she felt that it was breeding people that shouldn't be alive, right, and was inhibiting us from evolving into something better. So the eugenicists really sought to intervene and use artificial selection, and we'll talk more about those methods later, to effectively counter what doctors and Christians and others were doing to take care of the sick and the poor, to bring man back to what nature intended it be, so, intended man to be, so that man could evolve and progress. Now, I mentioned earlier that Francis Galton 
um, coined the term eugenics in the late 1800s and was the father of that particular movement. But eugenics was practiced long before our modern times. Uh, this is actually part of Roman law called the Law of the Twelve Tables, so back in four, about 450 BC. They said an obviously deformed child must be put to death. And Plato and Aristotle both supported this practice. Um, it was not uncommon for infants to be left outside the home for a period of time uh, with the Romans to determine if they were fit enough to survive because because they only wanted the best, right, for their future warriors. But I want to fast forward to the time of Galton, because he is the father of eugenics, and explore further the foundation or the basis, like where is this coming from, right? Why, why, where is this mindset um, based in? And I want you to listen to what Galton wrote to Darwin. Now remember, Galton and Darwin are cousins, okay? And so Galton wrote this to Darwin after he read Darwin's book on the origin of species, uh, which is, again, Darwin's seminal book on evolution evolution by natural selection. Galton said this, I have laid it down, meaning origin of species, in the full enjoyment of a feeling that one rarely experiences after boyish days, of having been initiated into an entirely new province of knowledge, which nevertheless connects itself with other things in a thousand ways. And so what he wanted to do was to take what Darwin had talked about in the book, which mainly dealt with animals. It didn't really deal with man that much. And he wanted to apply that to man, right? And he wanted to apply those mechanisms of evolution, specifically selection to man. He, Galton said the creed of eugenics is founded upon the idea of evolution, that we can evolve into better and better humans. Galton went on to say, eugenics must be introduced into the national conscience like a new religion. It has indeed strong claim to become an orthodox religious tenet for the future, for eugenics cooperates with the workings of nature by securing that humanity shall be represented by the fittest races. What nature does blindly, slowly, and ruthlessly, man must do providentially, quickly, and kindly. So again, this idea that nature wasn't working fast enough, wasn't working well enough, we're intervening too much in, in the sense of keeping the people that are defective alive. And so he said, we've got to intervene. We've got to stop this. We've got to do something to prevent this. And he said, could not the undesirables be got rid of and the desirables multiplied? And Galton promoted the idea that things like human intelligence and other hard to measure traits, such as behavior, were greatly influenced by heredity. Okay, now they didn't really know much. They didn't really know about DNA at that time, but they knew that there were things that were inherited. But the mindset of the day was that the environment um, really affected people and how they were, not heredity. So he's kind of changing that with his idea. And his book, Hereditary Genius, in 1869, was the first social scientific attempt to really study genius and greatness and what makes people good and, and should, those are the desirables that should be reproducing. It was well liked by Charles Darwin. So you really see how they, if you read their letters to one another, you really see how they're sort of feeding off of each other and those ideas are being incorporated into the next things that they publish. Darwin wrote this after reading Galton's book. He said, I have read only 50 pages of your book, but I must exhale myself else something will go wrong with my inside. I do not think I ever in all my life read anything more interesting and original and how well and clearly you put every point. So Darwin then took his ideas, right, and had a great influence on what he presented in his next book, The Descent of Man, just a few years later in 1871, Darwin wrote this, Thus the weak members of civilized societies propagate their kind. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. It is surprising how soon a want of care or care wrongly directed leads to the degeneration of a domestic race. But expecting, excepting in the case of man himself, hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. And he's talking here about human beings, right? He's not talking about animals. He's talking about human beings. Like, why would we let the defectives and the undesirables breed and multiply because it's bringing us down, right, as humankind. So we see that the concepts of evolution are really the foundation of eugenics, that man can evolve into something higher and better if we just get rid of the undesirables and increase the desirables. Now, I want to move, move though, from Europe to America, right, because all this is happening over there, but what about here? 
Because although eugenics got its start in Europe, it was really never well funded and never really gained much popularity. But it did here in the US, sadly. Um, so this is happening in the late 1800s, but especially the early 1900s. It was very well funded by modern day philanthropists. Um, at that time, people like Carnegie, Rockefeller, and Kellogg, which are all very familiar with those names, but they put a lot of money into this. There were eugenic societies, conferences, research institutions, scientific journals, eugenic departments, and courses at the university level. Like you could literally go and major or get a degree in eugenics. And this is the logo of the Second International Eugenics Congress that took place in 1921. And the roots here at the bottom of the tree represent different areas, things like genetics and history and mental testing, psychology, genealogy, economics, right, law, medicine, all these things were supposedly um, all aspects of the self-direction of human evolution. So in other words, who becomes the ultimate authority at determining life? man, right? Not God. Not all life is valuable because human beings are made in the image of God, but rather that man decides. It's the self-direction of human evolution based on what man thinks, right? So it's very arbitrary. Now, there's two main categories into which eugenic practices fell, and that is both positive and negative. So let's talk about positive eugenics first. Positive, the idea is to increase the fit or the desirables, and so they would promote the marriage of the well-born and encourage them to have lots of children. I mean, that was the idea. So they would go around a lot to um, county fairs because that was a very popular thing to do, the entertainment of the day. So lots of people would turn out for those and they would have eugenic exhibits at these fairs. And um, on the lower image there, this is what that sign says. It says, some people are born to be a burden to the rest. Every seven and a half minutes, a high grade person is born in the U.S. will have ability to do creative work and be fit for leadership. About 4% of all Americans come within this class. Okay, that's not a lot, right? So that means a lot of other people are really not the desirables. They would even have contests. They called them fitter families contests. And they would present medals, right? This was a medal that was presented by the American Eugenics Society. And it says, I have a goodly heritage. The picture is the, um, uh, the winner of the large family class at the Kansas State Fair in 1925. They wanted the, again, the fittest to have lots of children, right? The idea is to increase those des desirables. So how did they decide who was fittest, right? Because they didn't have genetic testing, especially like we would today. And some people might use that and say, well, that's how you determine it, right? How many mutations are there? They didn't have that. So they looked at a number of physical and mental or behavioral traits. Almost every trait that a person exhibited was considered heritable, right? Not that it's just your personality. It's been caused, you know, maybe you've been affected by your environment, but rather it's just part of who you are. Um, leading eugenicist Charles Davenport said, when we look among our acquaintances, we are struck by their diversity in physical, mental, and moral traits. They may be selfish or altruistic, conscientious or liable to shirk, for these characteristics are inheritable. So again, it doesn't matter what your personality is. If you're funny, if you're more morose, whatever it might be, he would say that's something that you inherit. You are nothing more um, than essentially the sum, we would say today, the sum of your genes. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow because we see that mindset becoming more and more popular. All right, so let's, so let's switch to negative eugenics because a positive eugenics was never as popular, sadly, um, as negative eugenics because there's a lot of horrible things that people did in the names of eugenics. Um, and the idea with negative eugenics was to decrease the unfit, the undesirable. So one of the ways that they did that was by prohibiting birth. Um, and that was through the forms of birth control and sterilization especially, and even sometimes abortion, um, segregation. And so that we could see in the marriage and immigration restriction laws, as well as institutionalization of what they considered the unfit. Now, in 1911, um, Henry Laughlin, another leading eugenicist, and a committee from the American Breeders Association. Now, the American Breeders Association up to this point had just dealt with animals, right? But now they're going to deal with human beings. They actually had meetings to decide what how do we define the socially unfit or the undesirables? Because if you're going to say these people need to be sterilized or segregated or not marry, then you have to have some way of defining who those people are. So they came up with 10 groups of what they considered socially unfit. So they said, first, the feeble-minded, second, the pauper, third, the inebriate, uh, fourth, criminals, fifth, epileptics, and sixth, the insane. So just by being poor, 
right? You were considered unfit. Um, I don't know what they mean. I mean, again, feeble-minded, right? That's very broad. I forget things from time to time, and the older I get, the more that happens. So I'm not sure if I would fit into that. Um, epileptics, when they say that, they don't just mean people that have what we would call today epilepsy. They mean people that had migraine headaches, people that had fainting spells, okay? Which obviously some of you are saying, well, that would include me, right? Um, so that's an issue. They go on to say, seventh, the constitutionally weak, Eighth, those predisposed to specific diseases. Ninth, the deformed. And tenth, those with defective sense organs. So basically anybody that was blind, deaf, or mute. And although it's not listed or stated in this list, those of so-called races other than the Caucasian race would, by mere fact of their ethnic background, be placed into one or more of these categories. Now, again, we'll talk about this a little bit later. There's no such thing as multiple races. There's one race, right? We all come from Adam and Eve. But they would say, we would say, they're talking about people groups here. So other people groups other than Caucasian would have been in one of these classes. And what's interesting, I think, is that Charles Darwin, for example, was um, very sickly throughout his life. He probably would have been considered constitutionally weak. So he himself <laughs> um, would have had a problem problem, um, been considered socially unfit. But again, these are very broad, very vague categories. There's no indication of degree needed to qualify as unfit. And, you know, when I read this, I thought it's very similar to the broad categories I talked about at the very beginning with the um, Groningen Protocol to decide if an infant should be euthanized, right? Not much has changed in 100 years. Um, so the eugenicists believe that about 10% of the American population fell into these broad categories, and they were sometimes referred to as the submerged 10th, right? Only very few were high grade. We read that earlier, right? And the rest were okay, but then there were about 10% that really they felt should not be allowed to reproduce or go on. Um, and all of these traits, again, everything that I just talked about was thought to be inheritable, right? So you inherited poorness. <laughs> um, you inherited a, being constitutionally weak or forgetful or, or whatever it might be. And eugenicists wanted to develop programs to get rid of them. So let's talk about some of these negative eugenic practices in more detail. So the first one is forced sterilization. Um, 1907, Indiana enacted the first state sterilization law. 30 states um, eventually enacted such laws. And between 1900 and 1970, keep that in mind, 1970, 60 to 70,000 people were forcibly sterilized. And that's at least according to official records. The, in reality, probably many, many more were sterilized, but it was never reported. Um, and in this map, every state that has lines through it or is in black had a sterilization law on the books. So they were sterilizing those that were considered in those 10 groups of socially unfit. Um, and so who were those unfit, right? So it's very similar to their criteria, so it lists it by state here, the feeble-minded, the criminals, the insane, the idiots, the imbeciles, and this is their wording, not mine. Okay, this is what they called people. Mental defectives, eleptic, epileptics, morally degenerate, and sexually, sexual perverts. So again, it's very vague, it's very broad, who falls into those categories, who doesn't. And what's really sad is some people that were sterilized, even maybe in the 40s or 50s, didn't find out until many years later, right? When they tried to have children, they were told they were having some other kind of surgery, but they actually sterilized them. And some states have had to, they've been sued, and some states have had to give money now to those individuals. So this is something that um, we're starting to get out of that because, again, so much time has passed, but it still, it still it sometimes comes up, you see it in the news. So even though um, state laws for, for sterilization were enacted as early as 1907, the issue was really brought to national attention in the Supreme Court case case of Buck v. Bell. So Emma Buck, who is pictured on your right, was considered uh, feeble-minded, and she was institutionalized in Virginia. Her daughter, Carrie, who is beside her there, was raped as a teenager, and she was subsequently institutionalized at the same place as her mother. And she gave birth to a baby whom they named Vivian. So to see if the new Virginia sterilization law would pass a legal challenge, the director of the institution where Carrie and Emma were um, filed a petition to sterilize Carrie, who was only 18 years old at the time. Now, her guardian appealed this, but it eventually went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And during that trial, they showed this genealogical tree, so to speak, of Carrie and Emma. So they said Emma, which is here in the yellow box, was uh, feeble-minded, right? 
And she gave birth to Carrie, who was also feeble-minded. That's what the F stands for. And then Carrie gave birth to Vivian. And Vivian, at the age of seven months, was considered to be feeble-minded and have backwardness. Now, I don't know how you determine that for a seven-month-old child, but that's what they determine. And the Supreme Court um, Chief Justice at the time, Oliver Wendell Holmes, said this, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles, meaning Carrie and Emma and um, Vivian, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Right? And so we see them wanting to and sterilize Carrie, and they did. Um, they sterilized her at the age of 18 uh, because of how this was decided in the U.S. Supreme Court, that these sterilization laws were legitimate. And after that time, they rose um, a lot in all of the states that they were legal in. All right, so that's one eugenic practice is sterilization. Another one is immigration restriction. And in 1924, we have the Restriction of Immigration Act, which put quotas on the number of people that were allowed into the U.S. And the reason for these quotas was because they believed that people of other races, which again, we know there's only one race, but other people groups were less evolved than the so-called Caucasian race. So they would show pictures like this at eugenics conferences. And what they're trying to show in in this picture is to say that the brain case of a, so what they're calling a white baby is bigger than the brain case of a black baby. And um, therefore white babies are more intelligent um, than black babies. It's completely untrue, right? This is completely untrue. But nonetheless, this is what they're trying to show to support their idea. Um, you would see pictures like this, where you have the Caucasian woman in the middle, surrounded by people that look more savage, quote unquote, um, as they say it. Um, and in this particular picture at the bottom, it says, can the great variety of characteristics that go in to make up the different races be safely ignored in tracing the racial history of mankind? So the idea is if you're going to say safely ignored, you're indicating there's some sort of inherent danger here, right? Some sort of danger that is um, problematic with these people of other so-called races. Now, the other thing they did was marriage restriction, or what are called anti-miscegenation laws. So miscegenation means to mix kinds, right? And so this is an anti-mixing kinds law, basically. So most of us associate this with applying to what are so-called so interracial marriages, which again, like I said, there's no such thing as that, but that's what they're applying it to, and marriage between defectives. So it wasn't just about interracial marriages, it was about um, these so-called defective individuals too. And again, Again, I'm using their terminology, so please understand that's not mine, that's their. And the purpose was to keep the Caucasian race pure and to limit the number of defectives. And what's really sad is that in the U.S., there were marriage restriction laws, at least between people of different races um, in most states, and most were not repealed until after 1948. All right. So again, this is something that's happened in recent times. So this is another chart that was actually shown at the Kansas uh, Free Fair that showed marriages of fit and unfit. So what would happen if, in other words, an abnormal person married a pure person, right? Well, they would have a tainted child. And then that child goes on to marry someone who's abnormal, and they have abnormal children and tainted children. And, and it says, you can read that, it says, how long are we Americans to be so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle, and then leave the ancestry of our children? to blind chance or to blind or to chance or to blind sentiment right so this is the idea right we do this for our pigs and our cattle we need to do this for humans because after all we're just animals too and it's just a matter of breeding us correctly so we can evolve so in the united states christian response only the fit to reproduce and marry and not the unfit. I mean, this is what was going on. So many sadly accepted this so-called science of eugenics without analyzing it in light of the Bible. Okay. And again, we see this happening a lot today. Connection between organized religion and talking about how religion responded to the world, particularly geologists' evaluations of the Earth's age challenged a literal interpretation of the Bible and seemed to strengthen the materialistic elements of life while undermining the miraculous elements of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And I thought, oh, yep, 
I, I know, right? Where did the undermining of biblical authority start? It started right at the beginning of the Bible with the foundational book of Genesis, right? So if these pastors were going to accept the Genesis wasn't true, then it's not a far cry to accept the other parts of it aren't true as well. She goes on to say, most ministers responded to the growing influence of science, not with denunciations, but with well-intentioned efforts to incorporate scientific methods into their own belief systems, right? So they're not going to deny them. They're not going to basically compare them to scripture. They're just going to say, oh yeah, science is true. Let's just fit that into the Bible, right? And so what happened? Faced with the challenge to faith posed by Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species in 1859, many Protestants again searched for compromise, right? And we talk about that all the time, the compromise that we're seeing in our churches today when it comes to the historicity and the authority um, that's presented to us in Genesis, not wanting to believe the biblical account of creation and the biblical account of origin. And in court, instead, people want to incorporate man's ideas about the past, including evolution and millions of years, and put that into God's word, try to make that fit, instead of believing what the Bible actually says, which is a literal six-day, 24-hour day creation just about 6,000 years ago. Go. So Christians started compromising. They started holding man's authority as higher than um, God's word and God's authority. So what happened as a result of this initial compromise that happened, again, not surprisingly, beginning in Genesis? She said, just as ministers had accepted a version of evolution that best suited the worldview, so too would they endorse a version of eugenics that did not on the surface undermine their theologies. Theologies that were, for many of them, pliable compendiums of belief to begin with, right? They were very liberal pastors. They didn't believe in the inerrancy and the, in, in the authority and the infallibility of the word of God. So to speak, it was just the next step. So just as they had compromised and accepted the science of the day in relation to origins and the age of the earth, so too they would then accept the so-called science of eugenics. And as we've seen, what's the problem? Well, we know evolution is the foundation of eugenics. So it just makes sense. If they're going to believe in evolution, then they're going to believe in eugenics as well. And when I read this, you know, I couldn't help but thinking, like I said, nothing's changed. It's very similar to our modern situation in which many compromised Christian leaders and pastors accept the so-called science of evolution in millions of years. They promote that idea in their churches, but they don't analyze many times the conflicts that are there between um, science and scripture and between um, what they believe and what scripture says. Or if they do see conflicts, then, sci then scripture is just so pliable for them, as she said, that they change their view of scripture instead of changing their view of science, right? Man's authority is higher than God's word. And not believing in the historical narrative that's presented in Genesis has led to their disbelief in other areas as well, right? Because now gay marriage is okay. Um, a disregard for the sanctity of life. Well, abortion is okay. I mean, we see pastors today um, promoting these things. And both of those are based in Genesis as well. One just follows the other, right? It's a domino effect. It's what we call the slippery slope, right? Once you stop believing in one, it's not a far cry to stop believing in the other as well and what the Bible says on these issues. So the problem then and the problem today Today is that God's word is not seen as the ultimate authority. It's man's word and man's ideas. So now that we understand um, the foundational idea of eugenics and how those were put into practice um, and how, what the Christian response was sadly to that, I want to turn our attention to Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood to understand how she and her organization work to promote and practice eugenics. Um, so Margaret Sanger, just to give you a little background on her, she was born in 1879, the sixth of 11 children to a poor family in New York. Um, her mother was Catholic, but her father was an atheist, and so she was committed to the Catholic faith in her early years, but became cynical because of her father's influence. Um, she did marry into a wealthy family, and she was married and divorced a few times, but she was heavily influenced by Thomas Malthus. Now, Thomas Malthus also heavily influenced Charles Darwin in the development of the concept of evolution by natural selection. Um, Malthus, Malthus was concerned that human population was growing too numerous, um, especially the poor, the diseased, and the disabled, and the racially inferior. Those are, again, terms that he would use. And he said, those keep growing, and so eventually they're going to outgrow natural resources, and there's not going to be left enough for the ones that are fit in society. Um, so she was influenced by him just as Charles Darwin. Darwin was influenced by him. And 
And so we need to understand that that's, that's an underground, underlying foundation here. In a speech that um, Sanger gave in 1929 called The Meaning of Birth Control, she stated, the practice of birth control raises us to higher stages in the evolution of life. As each individual progresses, he helps raise, to raise the human race and its evolution forward and onward to higher planes. So again, evolution, right? It's the foundation for eugenics and its practices. In order to evolve, in order for mankind to progress, the solution that was proposed by Malthus's followers, like Sanger, was to decrease and eliminate the inferior population through birth control. And at that time, what did they mean by birth control? There were some birth control methods available, um, but the biggest ones were sterilization, that's by far the biggest one, and also abortion. Sanger became one of the foremost champions of birth control, and not just for the seemingly benign reason that's often said of her in Planned Parenthood of helping poor women, right, who could not afford large families, but for, and I quote by Sanger, the liberation of sexual desire and the new science of eugenics, end quote, right? So she wanted to do what she wanted to do and not have to deal with any of the consequences of that and to promote, again, human beings to be better and better. And as we'll see, Sanger's views, like I said, they were in line with the leading eugenicists of her day, which she believed was not the exception, it was the rule. Sanger published a book in 1922 called The Pivot of Civilization. And all of these, I should mention, a lot of her things, almost all of them, are freely available online. You can find this and read it for yourself. But the pivot of civilization for Sanger was birth control. Um, and so this book provided a foundation or an understanding for what she was trying to accomplish with the American Birth Control League um, that she started in 1921, which would later be renamed Planned Parenthood. She said, the emergency problem of segregation and sterilization must be faced immediately. Every feeble-minded girl or woman of the hereditary type, especially of the moron class, should be segregated during the reproductive period. Otherwise, she is almost certain to bear imbecile children who in turn are just as certain to breed other defectives. Moreover, when we realize that each feeble-minded person is a potential source of an endless progeny of defect, we prefer the policy of immediate sterilization and making sure that parenthood is absolutely prohibited to the feeble-minded. Segregation was insufficient for Margaret Sanger, right? She said, I don't want to just segregate these people and not allow, you know, women to be with men. We just need to sterilize them, right? We need to do away with their ability to reproduce at all. And in the book's appendix, um, Sanger basically outlined what she considered the principles and aims of the ABCL, or the American Birth Control League, which in 1942 was renamed Planned Parenthood. So one of the aims of um, what she wanted to do was research, and specifically the science of eugenics, right? She wanted to um, stop the reckless breeding um, to the evils of delinquency, defect, and dependence, right? She wanted to research that and try to prevent that. Um, another aim was sterilization. Again, like I said, that's the preferred method of the insane and feeble-minded and those afflicted with inheritable or transmissible diseases. She also wanted political and legislative action. Um, and she actually said, and I quote, so laws changed and clinics made possible in every state, end quote. And we know that's come true, right? What she wanted there. She wanted to enlist the support and cooperation of legal advisors, statesmen, and legislators. And it, she wanted field workers, right? She wanted people to run these, organ to run these you know, local um, organizations, Planned Parenthood offices or ABCL offices, to help arouse the interest of the masses and support for the importance of birth control. And when I read this, I thought nothing's changed, right? The goals, these are very much the goals and object objectives of Planned Parenthood today. I mean, especially when you consider where most Planned Parenthood offices are. There are a high percentage of them in areas where, which are considered minorities in the U.S., right? Why? Because they're holding to these ideas of Sanger, their founder. Sanger also publicized many of her ideas and those of other eugenicists in her magazine entitled The Birth Control Review. And you notice what the tagline of this is, birth control, to create a race of thoroughbreds. I don't think it gets any more specific than that. I want you to listen to a short clip of Margaret Sanger speaking to Mike Wallace here. Now, this, it's a little raspy to listen to because it's older, but listen to what she says. Do you believe in sin? When I say believe, I don't mean in believe in committing sin. Do you believe there is such a thing as, a, as sin? I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents, 
that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically. Delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just mock when they're born. That, to me, is the greatest sin that people can, can commit. Now, I seriously doubt Planned Parenthood wants people to know this, right? But um, this is what she thought. And this is what is still being carried out today. I think it's interesting that she calls something a sin, considering she doesn't believe in God, right? She's being very inconsistent um, with her worldview there, so to speak. But I do think the name of the first magazine that she ever published and its tagline tells us a lot about Sanger's purpose. The first magazine she published was called The Woman Rebel, No God's no masters, right? She placed her authority over God's authority. She wanted to undermine biblical authority. She didn't want to abide by God's views on sex and marriage and the value of life, helping the poor and crippled, the oneness of the human race. That's very clear from her writings, right? You can read them and see for yourself. I could have shared with you many, many more quotes if we had time. So just as Darwin was a revolutionary in biology, so Sanger was a revolutionary when it came to the social sciences and these are connected because at its base, at its root, evolution is the foundation for eugenics. And many of her ideals are still prevalent today in, in the society and organization that she helped found with Planned Parenthood. So now that we have a good picture of the history of eugenics and the foundation that it provided uh, for abortion and Planned Parenthood, here's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. We're going to take a look at modern eugenics because this has not went away. This is not something that we just talk about in the past. It's here today. And the ways that the road is being paid for eugenics, not only today, but in the future, in the form of abortion and genetic screening and editing. So I encourage you to come back tomorrow to um, see more more about this because this is really, really important. But I want to help you know how you can become equipped on these issues. Because I realize that's a lot of information, it's a lot of quotes, but I want people, I want these people to speak for themselves, right? I want you to hear what they're saying. Don't just take my word for it, right? Listen to what they're saying and we can see the problems with that and how that's going to be accomplished today. So we have a newsletter that comes out every month. It's a great way to stay up to date with everything that's happening here at Answers in Genesis, the Ark Encounter, and the Creation Museum. All our great resources, um, things that we're doing online right now in the wake of being temporarily closed. So go to AnswersInsider.com and sign up for that. It's free. You'll also get a free digital download of Fire in My Bones, which is a testimony of Ken Ham and why this place exists, right? Why he wanted to start um, Answers in Genesis. This particular presentation, at least a form of it, um, is available in the Sanctity of Life box set that we developed a few years ago. Of course, the green one there, Eugenics, Abortion, and Genetics, is a um, presentation of the things that I'm talking about today. There's also a lot of other great DVDs in that series about death and suffering and playing God, uh, Stem Cells and Cloning by Dr. Tommy Mitchell, and then uh, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made by Dr. Dave Mitten, How the Baby Develops in the Womb. So this is a great set. If you want to get this and use it in a Sunday school setting or small um, group setting, eventually, right, we, don't, we, want to, we want to keep our distance from people right now, but you could even use it in a virtual or online study um, to help people really look at these issues, a lot of hot topics that we're dealing with today. I also want to mention this DVD, Abortion, Finding Hope and Healing. This is by my good friend Camille Kate, um, and she talks about um, her testimony, very, very powerful testimony in dealing with the issue of abortion. And that comes as part of our Embrace uh, Complete set. This was a women's conference that we did a few years ago. Um, and so there's lots of great topics in that, like homosexuality, disabilities, which we talked about a lot today and we're going to talk more about tomorrow, um, suffering, sexual sin. And so that's a, another great Bible study that you can do. It has study guides for each of the DVDs uh, to really help maybe uh, do a women's study in your church or other setting. How could a loving God, you know, we dealt a lot with this issue of death and suffering um, in this particular presentation. This is a great book, Ken's Testimony, dealing with the um, loss of his brother from a terrible disease and, and looking at that issue. Because uh, that's being asked a lot today, right, amid the pandemic. Well, if God is loving and kind, why does COVID, you know, why does this virus exist? And do these bad things. So we need to talk about that and think about that. One race, one blood. Again, I talked about the fact that we're one race, right? We come from Adam and Eve. So this book looks at this um, biblically as well as scientifically. And we have a version of that for kids because we want to train up the next generation to not be racist, right? To understand that there is only one race. The Lie of Evolution in Millions of Years by Ken Ham. Next to the Bible, um, it is the textbook of our ministry. It's who we are. It's why we do what we do. Gospel Reset. How do we evangelize the world today? We've got the 
ability to do that right now. You realize that? Like, even though we can only maybe contact people online or call them, we've got, they've got time to listen now, right? So why don't we do that effectively? You can read this book probably in two hours, but it's a really great read to help you understand how to do that in a world that's essentially biblically illiterate, right? That doesn't know who God is and so how to introduce that to them. The answers books one, two, three, and four and a flood of evidence. We sometimes call that the fifth answers book. Lots of great information on where to king and his wife, how to a day means a day. Um, what about the flood, the ark? Uh, what about radiometric dating? Lots of great information in there. And we have a version of those answers books for teens as well as for children because we really do want everyone to be equipped. We have our magazine. This comes out six times a year great family magazine. How do we build that biblical worldview, right? How do we look at what's happening in our society and in culture and in science and look at it from a biblical worldview? So it will really equip you to be able to do that. Has a little kids insert inside. Um, kids will have lots of great activities to do. You'll get a digital edition, so make sure you go online and sign up for that. Our Begin book, this is a great book for new believers, unbelievers, that has portions of scripture, uh, beginning in Genesis, going all the way to Revelation with some commentary to kind of tie it all together, and then what does it mean to be saved and answers to 10 most asked questions. We have some great deals on that. You can buy a box of them. Um, I think it's great to give to people as a witness. Uh, it's kind of the Bible in a nutshell. It's kind of a big picture framework of scripture, so it's a great place to begin if you're looking to understand the Bible. Be sure to join us for our Facebook Live programs every day at 10 o'clock. We have Science Live at noon. We have a special speaker. At 3 o'clock, we have an animal encounter. And at 7 o'clock, we have a behind the scenes. So you want to be sure to check those out on the Kinham and Answers in Genesis Facebook pages. Also remember, everything in our store right now is 20% off. Just to use the code Matthew6, right? And read Matthew6, right? There's a reason we chose that particular passage. Um, because we need not to be fearful during this time. But instead, um, take advantage of this time right? Use it to equip yourself and um, get that 20% off. Also, um, we would greatly appreciate um, during this time, obviously, that we're having to be closed. We want to continue doing what we're doing. And so we would appreciate any gift that you um, would see to donate and to give to us. So you can go online to answersingenesis.org slash give um, to give either a one-time payment or a monthly gift. Any gift of any size would be greatly appreciated. So thank you, and I'll see you back here tomorrow.